Good evening, everybody. ערב טוב לכולם. ברשותכם אני אעבור לשפה האנגלית, מפאת האורחים שיש לנו. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you here. We're very happy. This is one of the few times we've used this auditorium, so we're especially happy to have you here. Now, my name is Gabriel Motzkin. I'm the director of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, and I'm the chair tonight, and it's a special honor and privilege for me to present to you Professor Jose Casanova, who is not only an internationally renowned scholar, but also a personal friend whom we are happy to see again here in Jerusalem. I imagine to some of you I don't have to mention his groundbreaking work called Public Religions in the Modern World, which appeared in 1994 and which already foresaw the future of religious resurgence and talked about its exact place in the public sphere. His latest book is called Genealogias de la Secularización, which is a collection of essays that appeared in 2013. And I won't read the rest of the list of publications. He's won many prizes. He's a professor at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University. And he is going to speak to us, if I can find the title. It's on the back of this page somewhere. Yes, The Challenge of Religious and Secular Pluralism Towards Post-Confessional and Post-Secular States. And I'm wondering what those are. So please, Jose. Um, thank you very much, Gabi. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at this new uh, auditorium, indeed, and this new building. I was counting, I think this is my fifth visit to the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, so I'm very pleased to be back. It's a great honor to have been asked by legal scholars to basically address the uh, moral and legal challenges of the religious resurgence. I'm not a legal scholar myself. I rarely really uh, address uh, legal issues uh, directly, but I hope that the very, very broad uh, kind of rethinking of how we have to look at these religious resurgence may be of help also to legal scholars. Um, but, but before we begin to address the legal and moral challenges of the globally ubiquitous, ubiquitous religious resurgence, we must face the conceptual challenges presented by such a resurgence. Most of our political and legal theories have been based on secularist notions that assume that the religion in the modern world was going to decline or at least to become a private and politically irrelevant phenomenon. The very notion of, quote, religious resurgence as a legal and moral challenge is predicated on such an expectation. And so I would argue it is not sufficient to simply recognize the new unexpected facts. It is necessary to revise our theories of secular modernity upon which our expectations were based. Uh, if we are going to face realistically our contemporary global condition and the legal and moral challenges that it entails. In his new book, The Many Altars of Modernity, the sociologist Peter Berger has argued rightly that we are facing today two different kinds of pluralisms, namely the coexistence of different religions, this is multi-religious pluralism, and the coexistence of religious and secular discourses and worldviews. But Berger's revised paradigm of secularization, secularization is, in my view, still too much embedded within a theory of Western modernization that views secular modernity itself as the carrier or catalyst of both types of pluralism, multi-religious pluralism and secular religious pluralism. In contradistinction to Berger's argument, I would like to propose the European modernity is certainly the carrier or catalyst of the second type of modern pluralism, the secular religious one, but the European modernity is neither the carrier nor the catalyst of multi-religious pluralism. As the exceptional process of European secularization amply demonstrates, modernity per se does not contribute to religious pluralism. We need an additional factor or an analytical framework to understand the emergence of a global system of religious pluralism 
and this, in my view, has to be a theory of globalization, a globalization that both precedes Western secular modernity and continues in an accelerated and transformed manner after Western secular modernity. In other words, global religious pluralization emerged before Western secular modernity in the early modern era of global interreligious encounters that accompanied the European colonial expansion. Today, in our contemporary global age, religious pluralization has become accelerated in such a way that it begins to transform in the process also the heartlands of European secularization. We need to replace our single monolinear narratives of European secularization with a much more complex global narrative that is able to account for the intertwinement of two different historical dynamics that converge in our contemporary global secular age. These two dynamics are the internal European road of modern secularization, secularization and the external European road of, of global colonial expansion. It is this external global European expansion that serves as catalyst for the formation of global religious pluralization. European modernity leads to secularization, but not necessarily to religious pluralization. Globalization leads to religious pluralization, but not necessarily to secularization. It is the intertwinement of both processes that produces the combination of the two types of pluralism, multi-religious and religious secular. But this intertwinement should not be understood as a theoretical necessity, but rather as a contingent historical process that compels us to historize our sociological theories. We need to historicize both our analytical narratives of European modern secularization and our narratives of globalization, which cannot be understood simply as the global expansion of Western secular modernity. Let me offer a few remarks about the historization of our narratives of modernization before moving to a complementary theory of globalization. We can account better for the rather exceptional European pattern of secular differentiation if we take as the point of departure of our narrative not an ideal typically constructed sacred canopy supposedly shared by all traditional pre-modern societies, but rather a real and concrete historical milestone. We should also avoid non-historical functional narratives that construct differentiation as a straight linear process from the supposedly religiously undifferentiated system of medieval Christendom to modern secular societies. Following Berger's metaphor of the many altars of modernity, our narratives of the internal road of European modernization and secularization should be complex enough to account for the transformations from the many altars of antiquity to the single monotheistic altar of medieval Christendom to the coexistence of multiple monotheistic altars under the Westphalian system to the multiple altars of modernity. This is a complex historical development that cannot easily be compressed within the simple binary transition from tradition to modernity. We need to account for the complex transformation from pre-axial polytheism to the axial monotheist distinction of true and false religion to the contemporary global system of religious pluralism. In order to emphasize the intertwinement of the two European roads, the internal one of confessionalization and secularization, and the external one of global colonial expansion and intercultural encounters with the religious others, I propose that we take 1492 as the symbolic date that marks the beginning of both processes. Unlike the symbolic date of 1500 proposed by Charles Taylor 
as a dividing line between the medieval world of religious enchantment and the modern world of secular disenchantment and pluralization of belief options, which is still framed within traditional paradigms of modernization, the date of 1492 serves to complicate both our narratives of Western modernity and our narratives of globalization. On the one hand, 1492 marks the decision of the most Catholic kings to expel Jews and Muslims from Spain in order to create a religiously homogeneous confessional state. In this regard, 1492 marks the beginning of the European-wide process of early modern confessionalization of a state, nation, and peoples based on the principle cuius regio, eius religio, a process that crystallized in the Westphalian system of confessional nation states. On the other hand, as the date of the discovery of the new world, 1492 is also the symbolic marker of the beginning of the European global colonial expansion initiated by the Iberian monarchies. The Iberian colonial expansion made possible the connection of the old world of Afro-Eurasia and the discovered new world of the Americas, linking the East and the West Indies, thus forming for the first time one truly global world in novel transatlantic and transpacific exchanges. In this respect, the early modern phase of globalization constitutes literally the first globalization, a form of proto-globalization which can rightly be distinguished from, uh, from earlier archaic and later modern forms of globalization. Against simple theories of modernization based on the dichotomy of tradition and modernity, it is necessary to stress the fact that early modern reform religion, whether Lutheran, Calvinist, or counter-reformation Catholic after Trent, can hardly be understood as a traditional, taken for granted form of religion. Early modern reform religion was rather the outcome of a prolonged disciplinary process of confessionalization led by national churches under state sponsorship. This disciplinary process created new types of religiously homogeneous societies throughout continental Europe. A homogeneously Protestant North, a homogeneously Catholic South, and three biconfessional societies in between, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland, each characterized by their own pattern, patterns of internal territorial confessionalization based on confessional pillars, Landeskirchen, or cantons. In all the cases, the process of confessionalization was accompanied by religious wars and ethno-religious cleansing. In trying to ascertain the relation between modernization, secularization, and religious pluralization, it is important to stress that at least within Europe, the principle cuius regio eius religio remained practically unaltered through the transition from monarchic to national people sovereignty with the fall of the ancient regimes, or even through the process of massive democratization in the early 20th century. Homogenization, religious, national, or secular, rather than pluralization, remain the guiding principle of all three processes. Continental European societies had remained until, until very recently religiously homogeneous societies, and the only significant change had been that from belief to unbelief, that is unchurching, and an increase in secular religious pluralism, but not in religious pluralism per se. All significant differences notwithstanding, European patterns of secularization share similar paths from homogeneous religion to homogeneous nation to homogeneous secularity without noticeable dynamics of religious pluralization other than the more hidden dynamics 
of religious individu individuation which Thomas Luckman characterized as invisible religion. At the level of individual consciousness, moreover, Europeans have tended to experience the process of deconfessionalization and the accompanying individuation as a process of temporal liberation from ascribed confessional identities. Consequently, they have tended to experience secularization phenomenologically, not so much as indicated by Berger as a process of a spatial differentiation within their consciousness of coexisting, coexisting religious and secular modes, which would correlate with the differentiation of religious and secular spheres in society. They have experienced secularization rather as a historical process of religious decline that is of temporal and a spatial supersession of the religious by the secular. This is the secularist moment of a philosophical conception of history tied to the Enlightenment critique of religion that understands the secular as a post-religious temporal stage. The secular is what comes after religion. Intrinsic to this phenomenological experience is a modern stadial consciousness which understands this anthropocentric change in the condition of belief as a process of maturation and growth, as a coming of age, and as progressive emancipation. It is this combination of the dynamics of deconfessionalization and this secularist stadial consciousness that, in my view, account best for the unique pattern of European secularization without religious pluralization. Outside of Europe, by contrast, in much of the rest of the world, both the dynamics of confessionalization and deconfessionalization, as well as the secularist stadial consciousness, tended to be absent. There have been, to be sure, many attempts at national religious confessionalization linked to post-imperial and post-colonial processes of nation-state formation. But they have not been very successful in the long term, and today, in our global age, they are much harder to implement. What one finds instead throughout the world today are conflictive processes of religious pluralization and religious secular pluralism with milder secularization. To understand the dynamics of religious pluralization, processes of globalization linked to the external road of European colonial expansion are, in my view, more crucial than process of modernization. There is no need to revisit here, in detail, the well-known American system of religious pluralism cum secular state. But it is worth remembering that the American colonies became a refuge for all the religious minorities forced to migrate by the dynamics of ethno-religious cleansing connected with the process of European confessionalization. They also became the home for African religions brought by the transatlantic slave trade. American developments in this respect stand at the crossroads of both dynamics, of external process of globalization and of internal process of modernization, insofar as the American Revolution is intrinsically connect connected with the European Enlightenment. It is also important to stress that the American state was born as a modern secular state without having to undergo any process of deconfessionalization because there was no previous religious confessional state. Moreover, the dual constitutional formula of no establishment and free exercise guaranteed the development of denominationalism as a system of free and open religious pluralism in society based on the sectarian, non-ecclesiastical model of religious association. The legal secular principle of formal equality of all denominations tends to undermine not only the traditional European distinction between church and sect, but also the one between orthodoxy and heterodoxy, that is, the axial distinction between true and false religion. In this respect, the United States remains the first and paradigmatic case 
of the simultaneous development of the two types of modern pluralism, religious secular and multi-religious pluralism. In order to understand the formation of the modern system of global religious denominationalism, however, it is necessary to go back to the early modern phase of global European colonial expansion and to follow the encounters between Catholic missionaries who accompanied the Iberian conquistadores and non-Western peoples and cultures. I cannot possibly sketch here the contours of such early modern global intercultural and interreligious encounters in any systematic way. I can only have offer a few telling illustrations from a research project I am developing on the Jesuits and globalization. The Jesuits were not, or were neither the only, nor the first global missionaries. In fact, they follow literally in the steps of the older Catholic orders, Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, etc., who had preceded them in colonial Spanish America, as well as in Portuguese India and throughout Asia. In this respect, the Jesuit global mission was part and parcel of the golden age of global Catholic missions that flourished throughout the 16th, 17th centuries, well before the emergence of global Protestant missions towards the end of the 18th century. There were no Protestant missions before the end of the 18th century. 18th century. This is the era when Catholicism attained global reach from East Asia to North America, from the Philippines to South America. In fact, global mission became the specific foundational ministry of the Jesuits in a way that had not been the case of other Catholic orders. Jesuits took an oath, quote, from the formula of the Institute, the foundational charter, to travel to any part of the world where there was hope of God's greater service and the good of souls in order to minister to the Turks or any other infidels, even those who live in the regions called the Indies, or any heretics, whatever, or schismatics, or any of the faithful. This is the charter of foundation of the Jesuits. Global mobility was culturally encoded, as it were, into the makeup of the Jesuit order from its inception. Indeed, no other group took the entire globe as eagerly as the focus of their activities, taking inspiration from Jeronimo's Nadal famous slogan, the world is our home. The Jesuit Catholic missionary impulse had naturally, as a matter of course, the hegemonic purpose of universal conversion to the true Catholic faith. In fact, it is clear from the formula just quoted that Jesuits initiated their mission with the traditional and customary distinction between the true Christian faith or Catholic religion and all other Christian schismatics and heretics, Jewish and Muslim infidels, and the remaining pagans and heathens or idolaters. In this respect, the Jesuits never challenged the discriminatory distinction between true and false religion. But what makes Jesuit global missionary practices particularly relevant is the fact that under certain circumstances, their controversial method of accommodation took a form which we would call today nativist enculturation. Nativist enculturation. One should avoid, of course, anachronistic interpretations of early modern Jesuit practices from our contemporary global perspective of cultural and religious pluralism. Nevertheless, Balignano's method of accommodation in East Asia points to a formula of globalization that rejects unidirectional westernization and opens itself to multicultural encounters and reciprocal learning processes. This is the famous and controversial formula of Jesuit cultural accommodation, which led to the adoption of the Confucian habitus in China by Matteo Ricci, the Brahmin habitus in India by Roberto de Nobili, the Guarani habitus in the Reduction de Paraguay, but also the for us today less a commendable accommodating habitus of a slave owner in the Jesuit plantations in Brazil or Maryland. It entailed a formula of globalization of Christianity through the particularization of the universal by going local or native 
through a process of reflexive enculturation and acculturation. It was the differentiation of true universal religion and particular culture, as well as that between civilization and idolatry, first introduced by the Jesuits, that allowed the various accommodating syntheses of supposedly Christian universalism and cultural particularism. Particularly in the encounter with the multifaceted religions of Asia, the old catch-all category of pagan, heathen, or infidel began to collapse in a new plural system of what later would be called world religions began to emerge. Leaving aside the accuracy of Rich's interpretation of Confucianism and his negative view of Buddhism and Taoism, two things become evident from his and other Jesuits' accounts of the religious situation in East Asia. First, in their encounters with the religious other, the Jesuits are confronted with forms of religious pluralism which could not easily be fitted within the traditional taxonomies of false pagan or idolatrous religion. Secondly, in their recourse to natural law and the light of reason in order to account for the nature of this religious pluralism, the Jesuits initiate, in fact, a form of intercultural and interreligious encounter that takes place without reference to revelation. In a certain sense, one finds here the seeds of the two types of pluralism, multi-religious pluralism and secular religious pluralism. It is undeniable that the Jesuits serve as pioneer interlocutors in the religious, cultural, scientific, and artistic encounter between East and West and between Old and New World. Particularly pioneer Jesuits in Japan, China, Tibet, Vietnam, and India played an important role in transmitting and mediating the first knowledge about the foundational texts, religions, cultures, and civilizations of the Orient, which will later develop into full-fledged academic Orientalism. Indeed, in the list of early Orientalists from the 17th through the early 18th century, of the first 30 European names, over 20 are Jesuits. Similarly, José de Acosta's developmental theory of Amerindian religions as well as his comparative reflections on Amerindian cultures and the religions and cultures of Asia, presented in the Procuranda Indorum Salute, 1588, and in his Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, 1590, marked the point of departure of modern comparative ethnology and anticipate many of the later Eurocentric stadial theories of human development both being forms of imagining global humanity. In fact, despite their Christocentric assumptions and their frequent recurse to divine and satanic devices as explanatory keys in all forms of cultural and religious diversity, the Jesuit early modern imaginary of global humanity and their diapraxis of cultural accommodation and local enculturation appears less Eurocentric, less racist, and less unilinear than later imaginaries associated with the cosmopolitan enlightenment or with the 19th and 20th centuries mission civilisatrice and imperial white man's burden. One must concede that the long history of rather hostile Jesuit encounters with the world of Islam seems to present a clear exception indeed to contradict the Jesuit method of accommodation, as well as their supposedly open attitudes of enculturation and intercultural dialogue vis-a-vis -vis the religion of the other. But in fact, Islam was not so much of an exception if one considers the similar hostile and non-dialogical attitude in Jesuit encounters with Protestant heretics in Europe or with Eastern Christian schismatics in Eastern Europe, Ethiopia, or India. All those are cases of traditional hostile attitude towards well-known religions, which would seem to point to the fact that the practice of enculturation into unknown cultures, which share no long histories of mutual prejudices, 
may in fact have been much easier. But therein, therein lies the relevance of the Jesuit encounters with the religious other in early modernity and the role they play in the formation of a global system of religious pluralism beyond Western monotheist taxonomies. It is only with the modern recognition of the principle of religious freedom as an individual right, based on the sacred dignity of the human person, that the old religious taxonomy, based on the categorical distinction between true and false religion, is radically transformed. The old proposition that error has no rights gives way to the proposition that not doctrines, but individuals have rights. Under such a premise, the conditions for authentic interreligious dialogue are also transformed. The Jesuits play an important role in the discovery of those new religions and in their very formation. In a certain sense, all these non-Western religious traditions became first constituted as world religions in these early modern intercultural and interreligious encounters with globalizing Catholicism. I'm not implying that in their method of accommodation in Asia, the Jesuits anticipated the modern principle of religious freedom or religious pluralism. I'm only suggesting that their openness to cultural pluralism within the premise of Christian universalism did contribute through complex ways which cannot be explored here to the modern differentiation of religion and culture as well as to the process of dissociation of Christianity and the secular European culture of the Enlightenment. With this brief excursus on the Jesuit and early modern globalization, I could only scratch the surface of a complex development which is gaining increasing attention from the new field of global history. The new interconnected histories help us to understand the multiple ways in which the internal road of European modernization and secularization and the external road of global colonial expansion have been closely intertwined and have contributed to our contemporary global condition of secular religious and multiple religious pluralism. This dual road has led, in other words, to two different types of pluralism, a pluralism of secular and religious worldviews and a global religious pluralism. And therefore, our moral and legal challenge on a national as well as on a global level is a dual one, namely how to accommodate the two different types of pluralism. I speak of the intertwinement of the two roads because on the one hand, the Westphalian model of homogeneous confessional nation states also became globalized throughout the 20th century. One can see in post-imperial and post-colonial process of new state formation, whether in the post-Ottoman realm or in the British post-colonial realm, in Zionist Israel or in Islamist Palestine, in post-imperial China or in post-imperial Russia, the reproduction of similar dynamics of national homogenization and ethno-religious cleansing either in the confessional or in the lazy secularist variants. On the other hand, contemporary process of globalization, particularly through global migration, but also through new global conversion dynamics and religious flows, are bringing everywhere new forms of religious pluralism, even into the heartland of European secularization. No state in the world today can remain immune to these processes. Today, we find ourselves in a situation in which the two apparently contradictory global dynamics of national and religious confessionalization and the expansion of secular liberal democratic regimes protecting individual religious freedoms and religious pluralism are at loggerheads, but also working hand in hand together. Indeed, taking a bird's eye view of the global state, one can observe two seemingly contradictory trends. On the one hand, if one follows recent headline news about the decimation of Christian minorities in the Middle East, 
or the repression of religious minorities, Muslim, Christian, or Buddhist throughout much of the Muslim world, as well as in South Asia, Southeast Asia, or in China, one cannot but gain the impression that religious freedom and the rights of religious minorities are increasingly under siege throughout the world. On the other hand, if one looks more carefully at long-term historical trends since the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights 70 years ago, one can observe a dramatic increase in religious diversity, the constitutional protection of religious freedom, religious toleration, and the recognition of the, of the principle of religious pluralism as an intrinsic value throughout much of the world as well. It is because the principle of individual religious freedom as an inalienable right has become much more widespread that we have become also much more consciously aware and critically mindful of the frequent violations of such a right. Our normative expectations of religious freedom and religious toleration constantly clash with the reality of religious and political regimes still based on principles of religious homogeneity, a state control of religion, or cultural norms of collective religious identities that curtail the rights of individuals to proselytize or to convert to a different religion. We, by which I mean large sections of global humanity, have been moving since World War II, in particular in the last 50 years, from systems of monotheistic and monopolistic religious regimes based on the discriminatory distinction between true and false religion, or orthodoxy and heterodoxy, to a global secular system of religious pluralism based on three interrelated principles. The principle of individual religious freedom, the principle of a secular state that protects religious freedom and religious diversity, and the recognition of religious pluralism as a positive manifestation of the global human condition. The modern state becomes a truly secular state now, but not in the laces or secularist sense of adapting a critical negative attitude towards religion, preserving for itself the right to regulate religion and to keep it in its place, excluding it from the public sphere. The state needs to be secular precisely out of respect for the freedom of religion of each and all of its citizens and all its religious groups. In this respect, the secular state has the obligation to maintain a certain neutral distance from all religions in the name of religious equality, which implies not relativism, but rather the principle of equal respect toward all religions as well as towards non-believers. The secular state declares itself, if not fully agnostic in matters of religion, at least theologically incompetent to arbitrate in religious disputes or in matters of religious truth, abandoning the role of protecting orthodoxy and the true religion while proscribing heterodoxy. In fact, the secular state ought to assume the opposite obligation, namely the role of protecting religious minorities from majoritarian discriminatory rule. The third foundational principle is the recognition of a fundamental sociological fact of our global age, the recognition that global humanity is characterized by an irremediable religious and cultural plurality. This recognition in turn leads to the acknowledgement that religious pluralism, rather than being a negative fact that needs to be corrected and suppressed, is a positive principle that calls all religious communities to mutual respect and recognition, indeed to interreligious dialogue. But although the expansion of the three interrelated principles of individual religious freedom, a neutral secular state, and interreligious pluralism may be the most significant global trend of the last 50 years, it does not mean that such a novel trend is being institutionalized everywhere in the same way or is accepted always without resistance. On the contrary, we also see in many parts of the world open and at times violent opposition to each of these principles. Throughout much of the world of Islam, for instance, one still finds much resistance to all three principles. Many Muslim societies still function with a crucial distinction between true and false religion and use discriminatory distinctions between true Orthodox Islam, Sunni Islam, 
en schismatic, Shiite Islam, en heretic Muslims, Ahmadiyya, Baha'is, infidels, Christians and Jews, and idolatrous pagans. China represents another paradigmatic example. Notwithstanding the existence of a rich religious pluralism, the Chinese state, with its millennial tradition of Caesar or Papi's prerogative of defining orthodoxy and heterodoxy, represents today one of the most outspoken forms of resistance to the new global trend, insofar as it does not recognize either the principle of individual human rights or the identity of an non-ideological secular state that respects the religions of its citizens. Today, the Chinese communist state has abandoned its chimeric attempt to eradicate violently all traditional forms of religion and superstition in order to impose its own atheist state orthodoxy. It has relaxed somehow its repressive control of religion, accepting the fact of the existence of five legally recognized but tightly regulated religions, Taoism, Buddhism, Islam, Catholicism, and Protestantism. But it reserves for itself the right to determine which forms of religion are orthodox and patriotic and therefore in harmony with the Chinese state and which ones are heretic and therefore can be classified as either evil cults, unpatriotic or foreign, which endanger the unity of the state and the harmony of society. Moreover, it represses aggressively the religious rights of non-Han Chinese minorities such as Tibetan Buddhists, as Muslim and Muslim Uyghurs. Russia represents a different form of resistance to the principle of religious freedom as manifested in the alliance of an imperial secular authoritarian state and the Russian Orthodox Church, which through the Moscow Patriarchate maintains its canonical territorial claims over many of the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union. Despite its constitutional self-definition as a secular state, the Russian state makes de facto discriminatory distinctions between three types of religion. Russian Orthodoxy, which is the ethnic national religion of the Slavic people, the other traditional religions of Imperial Russia, and all other new, non-traditional, non-historical religious communities. But even long-standing European democracies, which at least in their constitutions already recognize the principle of religious freedom, have had to adjust in the last decades their traditional patterns of church-state relations in response to the growth of religious pluralism. All, I mean all, European states have been compelled to reassess their patterns of church-state relations, either because they were still too confessional, privileging the national majority religion over other minority religions, as has been the case in Lutheran Nordic countries, or because their insistence on a laic public sphere, free from religion, tended to discriminate, and still does, against all religion citizens. It is this reflexive recognition that has led influential European thinkers, such as Jürgen Habermas, to recognize the legitimate role of religion in the public sphere and to speak of post-secular societies. Indeed, a proper dual accommodation of the two types of religious secular and multi-religious pluralism will seem to require that the modern democratic and secular state adopt simultaneously a post-confessional and a post-secularist identity. But I'm neither, neither a legal scholar nor a political theorist. As a comparative historical sociologist, I do not believe in any universally valid formula, legal, constitutional, or institutional, which could be applied uniformly around the globe. Given the very different national, cultural, and religious context, one can at best hope for adequate practical adjustments towards such post-confessional and post-secularist settlements. Thank you very much. We're going to wait around until there are some comments in relation to the talk, because I think that there are many things that can be said about it. Um, yes. 
This is the microphone. Yeah, could you, Neri, could you bring it to the gentleman down here who is in the uh, fifth row, third in from the right? You can give it to him and he'll pass it on to you, sir. What are some preferable uh, institutions or states uh, in your Can eyes? you speak up? I cannot hear you. Do you have any favorite forms or states that you see that uh, applied the principles that you're talking about um, in terms of religious pluralism and uh, agnostic no. state? I don't think there is one single model that can be applied uh, uh, Some without models. contextual. I mean, uh, obviously, the French state cannot become an American state, and Americans cannot become a French state. Those are very two different types of secularism. Both have a conception of religious freedom, but very different, and very different types of conceptions of religious pluralism. Um, India is a secular state, uh, obviously much more favorable to religious pluralism than, than France, but very, very different model of religious pluralism in the United States, rather a collectivist versus an individual one. Uh, Lace is a state, I mean, you can have a post-secular uh, state like Turkey, which is trying, but uh, not fully successfully. You have within the Muslim world uh, relatively successful cases like Senegal, Indonesia, a little Bangladesh. Uh, so within each culture, you may have uh, uh, different models, uh, but I wouldn't say, obviously, uh, the interesting question is why, uh, let's say, if I look at post-confessional, post-Catholic societies, Quebec and Brazil have gone in radically different directions. In Brazil, you find an explosion of religious pluralism, while in Quebec, you have a homogeneous secularization from homogeneous Catholic that has difficulty accepting the religions of the new immigrants. So um, I am a contextualist in this respect, and obviously uh, Israel is a very unique case, and we could enter into uh, the pros and cons. We had a fantastic lecture this afternoon. We've been discussing the case of Israel in this respect in the, in the previous sessions. And, uh, so. the gentleman, could you pass the mic to the gentleman in the second row? Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, I studied with Peter Berger and with Norman Birnbaum in a bygone era, and indeed, your comments So you studied at the new school? Yes, yeah, yes. Well, in the welcome. In the 60s. I, I came a bit later, but I yeah. spent 30 years there, so. Uh, I think that we're uh, mixing, uh, I'm wondering if we're mixing, I'm not thinking, I'm wondering if we're mixing humanism and secularism. Uh, the Quebec situation is different. Quebec is up against a wall. They've been that way for the last 400 years. They have a problem. And uh, therefore, they can't uh, reach out. I lived 37 years in Quebec. Uh, and I'm wondering if what, you, you're, what you're calling secularism is, in fact, humanism, an openness towards other people, not from a religious point of view, but from a psychological or a social point of view. Well, I mean, the Jesuits were a clear case of Christian Renaissance humanism. They were humanists. They, they invented the humanist liberal arts. They globalized the liberal arts college everywhere. They were humanists. And basically, they, call of, they talk of Saint Cicero. In the, sometimes uh, they read the classics, dancing classics, with much more devotion than they read the Bible. Um, and the interesting thing is that when they established a college in, in Japan, they decided that not only to study the Roman and Greek classic, but to study Chinese and the Japanese classics, because their students should also be versed in the uh, humanist classics of Japanese Chinese culture. So yes, we are talking of a humanism before secularism. It is basically very different from the Enlightenment humanism. So I wouldn't put any doubt that the Jesuits represent a form of universal Christian Renaissance humanism based on the second scholastic phase of the Salamanca school with the use gentium, the protection of the rights of the Indians and, and right of slaves and so on. So they are pioneers in this respect, um, but they are not secularists. And yet, uh, the, the Pasquier, in one of the first uh, anti-Jesuit manifestos, calls them hermaphrodites because they are neither religious nor, or they are both, they are religious and secular. So you could say the first attempt by a French to pay the clear distinction between laicite and religion, obviously the Jesuits are both very religious and very secular. They were great astronomers, they were great geographers, they were great, uh, they constructed a lot of military force in the religious world for all kinds of, and in, Jap 
in Japan, in, in, in China. So they were very much in the world. They were very much secular, but not secularists. They were so they never accepted this distinction. Have to find a new secular. word, secular but not secular. I call it humanism. Uh, well, obviously you can call it humanism, but uh, as to Quebec, uh, I think there was a fundamental transformation with the silent revolution. What was before a homogeneous uh, Catholic society defined its nationality in terms of its Catholicity. In the last referendum, uh, the only defining kind of independent variable was how frequent you go to church. The more you go to church, the less you vote for independence. The less you go to church, the more you vote for independence. A very clear transference of Catholic nationalism to secular nationalism. And of course, they had difficulty accepting other religions. Well, I have a comment. So um, it strikes me that in those cases where religion is homogeneous, it's allied in some way, negative or positive, with nationalism or with a larger social sense. Now, I was a little confused. I must say, I wasn't entirely clear on what is meant by post-confessional and by post-secular, because they're nice words, yet we know what a confessionalization was, we know what secularism, or we think we do, we know what it is. And let me try to point out what I think the problem is. On the one hand, you have religions that are syncretic, like forms of uh, neo-pagan Catholicism or something in Brazil, or whatever you call it, you know, that adopt local things. And you have all kinds of syncretic religions, like Reformed Jewish rabbis came to Jerusalem and told me that their problem in America was the combination of Judaism and witchcraft. So there are all kinds of syncretic phenomena all over the world and what those stand for. On the other hand, you have the idea that religion is both more important and less important. And this is the great American invention by which it can be personally maximally important so long as it has no political meaning. And so there's a price to pay. You get a lot of personal meaning and no political meaning. Now, that idea is neither post-confessional nor post-secular, unless you think that America is the model for the future. And you think of, you talk about religious pluralism, but you could say that at some point maybe, maybe what you're going to get is a religious syncretism rather than a pluralism. Because you see, what the trouble with this religious pluralism is it's very unclear what place religion will play in the public sphere. I mean, I can say religious pluralism works in the private sphere. I'm a Jew, you're a Catholic, somebody else is a Buddhist, that's great. But, you know, but, if it, but in the minute you have in the public sphere religion, I wonder what religion in the public sphere, pluralism in the public sphere would mean. Well, I, I, I think that uh, religion in America was never privatized. Has always been public. Has always have a political role. I mean, Tocqueville argues that religion in America is uh, the most important of their political institutions. It's not a state religion. It's disestablished, but it's political. Has always been political. Every political movement in the United, in the United States, uh, from independence through uh, 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 the Jacksonian Revolution, uh, let's say uh, the suffragist uh, anti-abolition, they always have been based on religious mobilization. So every form, what we understand as, as modern civil uh, movement mobilization, uh, let's say tied with democracy in the United States was always linked to religious groups. So in this, I mean, this is what Tocqueville's thesis about uh, uh, how uh, religious associations are the foundation of American civil society, which is a form, of course, of political. Not, it was never uh, uh, turned into religious parties. You could argue that only since the 80s, with the emergence of the religious right, you have the beginning of a kind of a religious party, and then you have a lot of people turning secularists precisely, because the first time that the secular religious cleavages emerges in the United States, before you had cleavages between religious people, Baptists for, I mean, against slavery, Baptists for slavery. So, so it was not ever a kind of secular religious cleavage. It was basically, but religion was always involved in every political process in the United States. So I'm not sure that it was privatized. I'm not selling the American model of religious uh, freedom. Obviously, I don't think that it will work in many countries in the world. It's too individualistic. But on the other hand, it's a form of denominationalism. And what is important about it is that it's a denominationalism, which basically tells, who are you? I'm a Baptist, I'm a Jew, I'm a Methodist, I'm without a state intervention. 
So it's one in which people always know each other as members of a religious community. So it's a voluntary association. But the state does not determine, does not regulate, has not even the right to ask me, what is your religion? So it's a, and my argument is that we are in the process of formation of a global denominationalism at the global level of civil society, which is similar to the nomination, religious denomination, denominationalism in the United States, also precisely without the state intervention. And the argument I'm making is that the beginnings of this process of global denominationalism, where people call themselves confused, uh, they were not confused before Ricci told them you were confused. So Confucianism, as we know, it is an invention of Matteo Ricci, but it's stuck. And we know, of course, that Hinduism as an ism was a construction of these intercolonial encounters, but they are stuck. So the question is, uh, this form of global denominationalism, now what you say about syncretism, obviously, it's complicated. I mean, you know, look, uh, Pope Francis went to Sri Lanka and uh, welcomed the fact that you had Muslims, Hindus, uh, all play, praying in a, in a Catholic shrine to a Catholic uh, Madonna and arguing that basically it's only the theologians and the elites that create these boundaries. Ordinary people uh, basically have a way of, of crossing these boundaries and having interreligious ecumenical dialogue, not theological, but simply as personal recognition of each other. So I, I wouldn't uh, use syncretism here as a negative, necessarily as a negative uh, term. Obviously, theologians don't like it, but uh, most ordinary people uh, develop forms of syncretic religions. I mean. uh, Mr. Justice Engvard. It's a very interesting historical. Thank you for a very interesting historical. But uh, you didn't mention the notion Rousseau's notion of civil religion. I could have uh, answered to the thing of confessionalization, insofar as America has a civil religion. I mean, Rousseau is interesting, of course. Rousseau is the first one that argues, until now, every state has been based on religion. So which kind of religion is going to have the next Republican democratic state that I want to build, right? And so in the last chapter on civil religion, he rejects precisely Catholicism or any form of transcendental religion insofar as he introduces a dualism. This was the problem with monotheism. Introduces a dualism that makes any form of absolute loyalty to the Republic problematic because the loyalty to a transcendent force is more... F so he rejects any form of clerical transcendental form of religion. Uh, obviously, global humanity would be beautiful to love each other, but it's also transnational and cannot be the base of a Republic. So he comes with the idea of a civil religion. Now, Bella then turns into the yeah, argument, yeah. well, it's not so much that in America it actually there is a civil religion, which is different from all ecclesiastical religions. So all what I call denominations somehow partake in this civil religion, but civil religion is different from any particular religious denomination. So in this respect, the civil religion is the confessional religion of the American democratic state. So you could call it... On the other hand, uh, it's a very weak form of confessionalization and is radically being transformed all the time. So insofar as it is a confessional religion, this is the argument with, that we have today in the, in the Ruth uh, uh, in the afternoon. Now, I have no problem with the people of Israel defining this as a Jewish state as long as I allow everybody else coming here also to participate in the definition of the state of Israel. So, as long as, so we, the people in the United States, have been able to incorporate and this was the, the claim of Bella, through the uh, speeches of, inaugural speeches of presidents, uh, uh, transforming the uh, civil religion. He thought that there was a broken covenant with the Vietnam War and the, the counterculture and the, and the civil rights movement. But you could argue that Obama, once again, in his inaugural speeches, uh, redefined the civil religion. Uh, he talks not only of Christians and Jews, but of Muslims and Hindus in the first, in the first inaugural speech, and of unbelievers. So for the first time, he includes unbelievers in the American civil religion. And in the second inaugural speech, he talks of our brothers, gay brothers and sisters as part of, so of the American civil religion. So again, so you have as long, so I don't mind this type of confessional religion, that can be redefined constantly by the demos as to what it is that we, uh, who are we the people, as a people. Now, once, however, it is defined confessionally in a way that you cannot change it, then, of course, it's more problematic as a, as a, as a democratic uh, religion. But, uh, 
Uh, if you pass it to the gentleman with two rows in front of you. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. I'd like to follow up on uh, Professor Motzkin's question um, about the public sphere, specifically for religions that have religious law. So religious pluralism, post-secular with religious law. Well, again, um, as you know, I wrote a book on public religion in the modern world, precisely arguing about the role of religion in the public sphere. But it was very much within Western models of religion, basically Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant. And it's very clear that once you enter into uh, other forms of religion in non, non ecclesiastical religions, other forms of republican religion, as soon Islam, that have no clerical structure, uh, other forms, especially those which are more based on forms of uh, legal uh, 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 practice, uh, that obviously it raises fundamental issues of the relation of, uh, uh, if you use legal pluralism, which kind of, because one of the most difficulties, uh, uh, one of the most difficulties part of, of the modern democratic state is this definition of sovereignty as unitary, I mean, talking of Rousseau, and indivisible. And of course, it's very difficult, the most difficult conception for a modern uh, legal state is to accept legal pluralism of some kind. So which kind, this is again a different kind of accommod. I'm talking of religious pluralism and religious secular, but obviously this could be a way of uh, our post-secular states need to accommodate forms of also legal pluralism. India, India has done it. India is this fantastic democratic state. It has a lot of problems, but uh, you know, under very, very difficult conditions, has been able to maintain itself as a relatively functioning democratic state. Uh, under conditions that uh, we think are democracy would be impossible. Hundreds of languages, hundreds of ethnic groups, hundreds of castes, hundreds of religious groups, and uh, uh, precisely creating a system that's flexible enough uh, to have federal legal systems, very different legal uh, systems in different uh, states. Uh, different. Now, does it work very well? Well, uh, the Chinese would think it's a terrible system. Obviously, it doesn't work very well for economic development, but in the long term, it may work better than, than, than maybe Chinese. Um, we, we, we'll see, we'll see. This is something to be... So yes, legal pluralism is a fundamental question that has to be addressed. I have not addressed it here in my paper at all, but it's one of the forms of precisely religion. That's why religious secular pluralism is different from religious pluralism. In so far as precisely religious pluralism, already I'm not simply talking of individual religious freedom. That's why I argue the three principles. Individual religious freedom, yes, but also secular states. And third, uh, global denominationalism, which presupposes a way of each religion defining its own identity different from others. What is very interesting at the global level is this idea that each religion claims its right to be different, to be particular, while somehow maintaining also its claim that it has something to say to universal humanity. And it's this, this uh, kind of way in which each religion defines itself as different from every other one. That on the one hand creates uh, uh, fundamental problems for uh, uh, legal democratic system that would like to treat all religions as equal and, and without differences. I'm going to, is there any other question in the hall? Going once, twice, well, Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Professor Casanova, for a wonderful lecture. We hope, we hope to have you back on this podium post haste and make sure you visit us every year. I think my project on the Jesuits and globalization, yes. I'll come to talk yes. more about Good. globalization.